Um, so last time we were talking about, um, you know, the states of self-stress and, uh, you know, the, the equilibrium and compatibility matrices. I thought it would be worthwhile doing an example of how you calculate these matrices. This, this is a moving, uh, moving target, isn't it? I'll, I'll start here. Okay, let, let's look at a simple example of a network here. Let's see, how am I going to do it? Yes. So I'm going to have sites which I label 0, 1, 2, and 3, and bonds which I label 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. <clears throat> and I'm going to assign a direction for convenience. I mean, this is arbitrary. It just makes it easier to follow things. So I'm going to let this go like that, this go like this, this one go like this, and this one this way, and this one this way. Okay, so what do the arrows mean? The arrows mean that uh, if there's positive tension, this bond pulls from this site in that direction. Right? Now, of course, when you get done with the calculation, you may find that you've, you know, the signs don't correspond. There might be negative signs in the answers. But this is, so, so these are bonds. And we, what, what we want to do is to calculate the, uh, equal, the compatibility matrix. We want to calculate C. And you'll recall what C does. C takes displacements and converts it into stretches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so I... You know, this guy exerts a force on that. Now, what the force it exerts depends upon whether the spring is compressed or stretched, right? So I'm just assigning a, a direction so that I'm going to assign a, a, a positive saying, I'm going to say that I'll consider the case where this guy's pulling and this guy's pulling on that site. But of course, it could be that the tensions are the other way around. I don't know what the tensions are yet. But it doesn't matter. Once I've established a convention, I can have, I'll have the, uh, the matrix down. And I, it. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I mean, I don't really know. I just, I'm, what we're going to, you know, I'm after, I'm going to have stretches or compressions here. So, so in other words, this E will be positive or negative here. I don't know what, I don't know what the sign is going to be in particular, so I'm just assigning a, a, assigning a convention, and then if the sign comes out to be negative, it's going the other way. Okay, so <clears throat> what do we have here? We have that E1, that's the tension in this guy. There's no, there's no vector. I shouldn't have put that. Now, what is that equal to? That's the unit vector along the B1 bond dotted into the displacement of 1 minus the displacement of 0. That's what we mean by, the, by this matrix. Right. Uh, E2, oh, oh uh, okay, I've done this. There's this one. Uh, right. E2 is B2. At, dotted into u2 minus u1. So you see what's happened. I put the, the site that's to the right of the arrow first and the other site second. There. E3 is equal to B3 hat. So B3 points in the direction of the arrow. So, so the, the arrow is telling me what direction B points. And by the convention, this should be a u2 minus u3. Make sure I did that right. Uh, yes, that's correct. Uh, B4, E4, is equal to B4 hat dotted into u3 minus u0. And then there's an E5, which is uh, B5 hat dotted into U3 minus U1. 
I'm sure I got all of those correct. Now, <laughs> this thing, of course, it's a free object. So no matter what I do, they're going to be, as it stands, the, the translation and rotation free modes. And what I want to do is to freeze those out. So I'm just going to fix this guy to be fixed. I clamp it down there. And then I'm going to let this guy be on a, a train that lets it go back and forth like this, but it's not allowed to go there. So u1 is going to be the vector. It, I mean, I, I should have said not, not u1. I should say, no, u, 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 u0 is that right. This is going to be u1x and 0 because I'm not going to let it go up and down. So that corresponds to what you do in a bridge. I don't know if you saw that picture, you know, this bridge. So what you do on a bridge, and, and, and if you actually go look at bridges, you'll see this happens. They've clamped it here, so it's stuck in the ground. And over here, they put a rail, so this thing can roll back and forth here, but it can't go up and down. And by doing that, I've frozen out the two translational degrees of freedom. And this is there because these things are made of metal, and they expand and contract, and you don't want to force it so that there's you know, bad tension in the system. <coughs> um, OK, so let's write down. So, so this tells us how we write the matrix. We just have to write this out in components. I'm going to have a 5 by 5 matrix, because there are, uh, <coughs> you know, I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 8 degrees of freedom. And I've frozen out uh, three of them. So, and then I have one, two, three, four, five bonds. So I have a five by five matrix that's going to come out. Um, so, our E then, we write down what is the E1. Well, B1 dot U1, E1 is in the one direction. It's a unit vector, so it's going to be one. And U1 has a U1x, and that's it. So this is going to be one, zero, 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 zero. And of course, we multiply here times the vector u1x, u2x, u2y, u3x, u3y. That's the five components there. <coughs> so we have the first one. Then we have b2 is, is equal to b2 hat. So I've taken this to be 60 degrees. So it's going to be b1x which is equal to 1 half. Uh, this is B, let's see, I'm, I'm up to B2. Yeah, I just did you, I just did 1. The B2 is, yeah, it, okay, it has, it has a minus 1 half here because it's b2 dot minus 1, and there's the b2 has a projection of a half in this direction. Okay? And then, and, and that, that's going to operate on the u1x, and the next one does the u2, so I have b1x on u2, that's 1 half, and then I have a root 3 over 2 here for the y direction. Then <coughs> for 3, we have B2, no, oh, I did 2, 3. I have B3, so B3 is, one, is in the 1, 0, 0 direction, or 1, 0 direction. It's pointing in that. So this is going to be uh, U2x, so I need this to be 0. U2x is a 1 there. And then it's minus B2 on U1, so that's going to be 0 and minus 1 there with a 0. And then we have u4. So b4 is the same as b2. And I'm going to get here. It only operates on uh, u2 and u3. So wait, no, wait a minute, b4. Oh, b4 has a uh, minus u0, and u0 is 0. So, so we don't have that appearing. I just have this then is 0, 0, 0, 1 half root 3 over 2 it only operates on those two things. And finally, I have b5 is, e5 is the b5, which is plus 1 half in this direction, 
uh, uh, minus one half rather in the x direction and root three over two in the other direction with a u three. So the net result is a one half zero zero minus one half and root three over two. <clears throat> and of course, this thing has no zero modes. <clears throat> And that means that uh, you know this this is going to be an invertible matrix, as it is, because there's no no null space in it. Okay. Now you can go <clears throat> and calculate the other matrix, which is to have Q times the tensions is equal to minus the forces. So again, <clears throat> this minus sign is something that causes consternation, but the forces I'm talking about are the forces exerted on these sites by the tension, the compression and stretches of the bonds, right? And when we get done, this calculation should give us that if you calculate Q, it should be equal to C transpose with, with that minus sign appearing there. So that's a homework problem. Calculate Q and show that it is, in fact, the transpose of this guy. Um, <clears throat> let's see, did I, did I derive for you last time that the relation that Q transpose is equal to C? Did I derive? OK, so, so let's do that. We, we want to prove this result. So it's pretty simple. What you do is ask, what's the work done by the load L. So you recall what the load L is. That is the force that just balances these internal forces. So these internal forces, and the L is you know, minus the sum of those things so that the, the thing is equal to 0. So what is that work done? Well, when you apply an external force, you'll displace the sites. So the work done by L is equal to L uh, transpose, I guess I want to write it now, transpose times u. In other words, this is the dot product of the force times the different sites, and this is, the, you know, the amount of work done is the force times the displacement. Um, and then we can say, well, the tension and the bonds also do work, and these two should be equal to each other. So we're going to say that this is equal to um, qt transpose u, equals T transpose Q transpose U. Now that's just using a relationship that QT is equal to L. This, by definition, is the L. <coughs> and um, then we can ask, what is the work done by the tensions? And that's going to be the tension causes the bonds to stretch. So this is T times E, and E is equal to Q, to C rather, times U. And those two things have to be equal, and you get that C, since it's for arbitrary uh, T's and U's, it has to be that, that Q transpose is equal to C, or C transpose is equal to Q. Okay. okay, now. <coughs> so, as I said, we, we are mostly interested in periodic lattices. Right. And that means we can do a Fourier transform. So we can introduce Q. Um, actually, I, I do want to say one more thing. I, I'm going to be interested in in lattices that have a basis. So periodic lattices, and, and I'm going to add that they have a basis. So I'm going to specify <coughs> RL. This is the position of the ELF site, of uh, the ELF uh, site in the Brave lattice. And this is equal to some L sub I, A sub I, where a sub i are the primitive translation vectors. And then I'm going to say that we have an L, and let me just make sure, yes, an L mu. So mu is an index which tells us which atom or which site in the unit cell I'm talking about. So you know, if I have a unit cell that looks like this, and I put two 
So I have three items in the unit cell. Mu would run from one to three, and that repeats itself again and again. So this is equal to RL plus, I'll call it, say it, little r sub mu. And now similarly for the bonds, um, for the bonds, I'm going to write RL beta equals RL plus R beta. And, you know, if I'm distorting things, I, I may have to put an L there to specify that the position can depend upon L, but at least in the equilibrium, I don't have to do, to do that. So the, here I would have in this lattice, I would have two bonds, this one and this one. And, you know, the next lattice over has this and that's over. So there are two bonds per cell in the lattice, and that, that, then I'd have an index of two there. And we can, we can Fourier transform a trans... Um, let me write this as L. There can be an L here. We can uh, Fourier transform them all. So, for example, I can write U mu of L is equal to, you know, uh, 1 over the number of cells, sum over Q, e to the i Q dot R L, e to the i Q dot R mu. And then I will have here u sub mu of q, and so on. So you know, they're, they're. <clears throat> now once I've done that, then the, all of these matrices break up into uh, smaller ones where I have, for each q, I have a block. Etc. And the, the block is such that the dimension is, is little d n cross n b. And for the Maxwell lattices I'm talking about, that constitutes square lattices, where little n is the number of sites in the unit cell, and n b is the number of bonds in the unit cell. And that allows us to write that we have c of q times See, I think I'm using the small letters here. Yeah, times u of q, and I'll put a, I'll put a tilde here just to... The notation is, is really enough to drive you crazy. Uh, this is plus e of q, and q of q times tension of q, I'll put a twiddle there, is equal to minus f tilde of q. And for each of those, we have the uh, Maxwell-Kaledine relation that the number of zero modes at Q minus the number of states of self-stress at Q is equal to dN minus nB, which for the Maxwell lattices, again, is equal to zero. And that tells us for every time we have a zero mode, we have to have a state of self-stress and vice versa. So. Um, what usually happens is that, uh, let me make sure I state this correctly now. Um, we, if, if we have a gapped lattice, we found that the states of self-stress at finite Q are not there, and so we have N0 of Q is equal to zero. That means that if, if we have a lattice that's gapped, the, so the only place we're going to have anything, any zero modes is at Q equals zero. And so, then I can say, well, let me look at the lattice. What is S of Q equal to zero? And for example, in the Kagame lattice, which we saw where we have the grids going like that, then there are, is, are three zero modes, uh, three states of self-stress. So that would imply that N uh, zero of Q equals zero is equal to three if that equals three. Whereas for a standard gap lattice, you would only have two. So the, the, the generic case of a gap thing is that or you have n0 of q equals 0 is equal to d, because that's the number of degrees of freedom that are free uh, in the periodic lattice. And that means that there have to be a correspondingly d states of self-stress at q equals 0. And the states of self-stress at q equals 0 are what support the, the uh, elastic rigidity. So we'll do a little more about that in a minute. Yeah. 
D little n is the number of atoms in the unit cell, and d is the dimension, and nb is the number of bonds. And you know, in the lattices where z is equal to 2d, like this one, here we have one site per unit cell and two bonds per unit cell in the square lattice, for example. Right? And in the Kagame lattice, you have, you know, the Kagame lattice, you have a motif that looks like this. It gets repeated. So there are three sites in the unit cell, giving us six degrees of freedom and one, two, three, four, five, six bonds balance each other out. And it's, you know, all of them are fourfold coordinated because, you know, that guy goes out there and there's one that goes like that, but it's in the next cell over. N0 is the number of zero modes, yes. Okay. Now, did I lose my place here? I think I lost my place. And I do that. Oh, yeah. There we go. Okay, this is now just a little bit of bookkeeping. We want to look at the dynamical matrix. So recall that we said that our total energy could be written as one half e uh, k e where k is the matrix of spring constants. Most of the time, I'm going to take them to be the same. But you could make the spring constants difference within the, for the different bonds in a unit cell. And then k would you know, be a diagonal matrix. Uh, this goes to 1 half sum over wave numbers of, and I think there's a 1 over n out here, c, times e of q tilde dot k dot it's a transpose here, E of Q. And maybe there's a minus Q there. Okay. So now we've broken up the energy in, into little blocks. And now I can take this guy and write it as one half. There's a transpose there. Uh, this is um, CU transpose E, a K rather, times CU which is 1 half u transpose c transpose k c u. And here we get e uh, 1 half u transpose of minus q c of minus q transpose k c of q u, little u of q. And this thing right here, is um, if all of the masses are the same, this is the dynamical matrix times, times the mass. And so you, know, if you, you can write down the equations of motion, and you end up that omega squared u of q is equal to the dynamical matrix times u of q, giving us that omega squared is equal to the i, well, calculate the eigenvalues of d, and you get the, the frequencies omega squared. OK. Now, make sure I got taken care of all the little things right. Let's just look at OK, so now I want to do one thing about what happens in the elastic limit. Um, you know, we've, we've identified what the, you know, how we get a hold of zero modes at, at non-zero wave number. But what about the elastic response? So let's look at the, uh, I have a U, and it has a site at some a cell S, and I will label it beta here, minus, let's, and where, where am I going to put the primes? Yeah, this is OK. So that's the difference in the displacement. This is what we were calling, this is what we called E of uh, beta if we dot this into B beta hat. And 
what we're going to do is to set this thing equal to a matrix eta times Rb of S eta minus R R of S beta minus R of S beta prime. Okay, so this is the separation before I've stretched. Something wrong? <laughs> uh, this is the separation before I've stretched. And now when I stretch it, I get something which is a matrix, which is like one of the lambda matrices. We, 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 before we wrote lambda is, is one plus an eta, or sometimes I called it gamma. And if eta is the same everywhere, then I have an affine response, an affine uh, uh, distortion of the lattice. So we can say then that E affine, uh, let's see now, I got this right, E affine, yes. Uh, Oh, yeah, and, and so this guy, okay, I, I, I knew that. there's one extra step here. So this, this is actually equal to B beta. So, so B beta is the bond of the rest lattice at, before it's been stretched, and it has a length and a direction. So I can now write this guy, E beta, and it's an affine one, is equal to B beta transpose times eta times B beta. The A to B beta comes from this part, the B transpose comes from this, and you know, these are matrices, these are vectors, and that's a, a, a tensor there. So you so get bothered by keeping on writing things. Okay, so I now have an energy, I could say that the affine energy is equal to you know, the sum over all of the betas, all of the bonds of one half of E beta affine K E beta affine, and this would be a transpose here. But that's not the whole story. Remember that the affine, all I'm really insisting upon when I oppose, impose an external strain is that the sites on the unit cell deform finely, but inside the unit cell there can be some relaxation. So what I can say is the actual energy is going to be equal to, everywhere where I see an E beta here, I'm going to replace it by, uh, actually I wanted to write, I needed to write this in one more step, I think. Do I? Uh, da, 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 da. Now, okay, yeah, this is fine. So, so here, or did I thought I wrote it in macroscopic form. I can write it schematically as E affine, let's, let's write it down here, E affine transpose times K times E affine. So this now takes care of all of the sums over beta and everything. It's a shorthand. And what I'm going to say is, well, this is the set of displacements which are just affine. But I can add here a term which says I can have other displacements that are going to relax. So I'm going to write the total energy as 1 half E affine plus, well, remember that E is equal to Q times uh, U times U, so I can write this as U transpose, uh, it's C times U, I can write it as C transpose with a U transpose here. A is also as transpose. A and then E affine plus C U. And what I want to do is to minimize over the U's. But there's something we should know about here. The C's possibly have, th this is a Q equals zero. So we know there are, have to be at least 
two zero modes for each wave number Q. And so I have to worry about the fact that there are null spaces in C and Q. So I can break C up into a part that's a vector that, whose components are only in the range of C, a part in which the vectors are only, that, that this only operates in the space of the null space. And then you can have couplings between them, CSR and CRS, like that. So anything that's in the null space, if I operate it on, on, on a vector, any vector in the null space gets a zero from hitting this guy, if I hit him on this side. These guys, uh, if I hit this on the right with a vector, this goes away because this, you know, the right-hand side, this is coupling vectors in the null space with vectors in the, in the uh, range. And similarly, if I operate on this side with any vector, the only thing that's going to survive is this guy. So the net result is that this becomes 1 half times E affine T plus U in the range of T, C R, uh, QRR, recall that C transpose is Q, K here, E affine transpose plus C R, well, I'm going to call it Q transpose here, Q transpose R, R, U, R. Okay? So that means that out of all of the components that, that U has, the only ones that I can fiddle with are those that are in the range of Q. Now I can minimize this over UR. I take this whole energy, U total, and I differentiate it with respect to the components of UR transpose. I could have done it UR, it doesn't matter. And this is going to give me, um, make sure I've got this right, it's going to give me uh, yeah, the QRR is going to be here, K, and then over here I have E affine, T plus Q transpose RR, UR, and that's supposed to equal zero. Now, this guy is by definition an invertible matrix, basically. I've gotten rid of all of the zeros. So since I have a zero over here, I can just cross that out. This guy is also invertible. So I can throw him out, and we have this relation. Now, you may think this is trivial, but remember, this guy has parts that are, can be in both the range and the zero mode part. So I want to break him up into E transpose. I'll just put an A here instead of a fine. R plus E transpose A. Uh, this should not have been a transpose. Sorry. Let's make it E. E A in the in the in the null space. So rearranging this statement, what I get is that um, let's see where do I have it? That E affine R is times let's see where is it now? E affine R plus Q transpose R R times U R is equal to minus K R R inverse. Actually, so I, it looks like I wanted to keep the K. Now, why, why do I want to keep the K? Uh, Well, I'll keep the KRR inverse there, and I'll talk about it in a minute. KRS times E affine S. Um, yeah, I, I needed to keep this here in order to um, pull, pull him through. So, so I just kept the K there, and I broke it up into an R part and a part that operates on, on R on S. And now what we have is a solution for 
the part in the range in terms of the affine strain projected onto the null space. And when all of the dust settles, what that gives me is that V, well, this, this U energy is equal to one half E affine S transpose times KRR minus KRR K R S K R R inverse K R S times E of fine S. And this can be written as K S S inverse inverse. I mean, you can just go through and carry out that operation. So now what we have is we've minimized over the extra degrees of freedom, and we've expressed everything in terms of strains in the null space. And uh, right, and so you know, the sum is only over the dimension of the null space. So if I'm talking about a system where I have two zero modes, then this thing will give me two components in a sum. So I can write this as and let me just see how I write this right. As let, let's, let's make things simple and make S a constant. And this just becomes K if I do that. So I don't have to, K a constant, so I don't have to worry about all of those extra terms. And this then becomes 1 half K that comes outside, sum over alpha E affine projected onto the null space, dotted into the basis vectors for the null space squared. So in other words, here, you know, I, I'm, um, I, I can decompose this vector into the components along in the space, in the null space. And the null space of dimension two would have two t's here, which span that space. And this is the easiest way to write that. So what this tells us is that I will have a sum of terms, squares of, of displacement energies, uh, with a number that's equal to the number of states of stress, self-stress at Q equals zero. So that's nice because your intuition would tell you that the, in, that the states of self-stress are going to be what determine whether or not the system is, is stable. Right? But it also tells me something interesting. If we have the fully gapped, fully gapped system will have um, n, a number of states of self-stress equal to d at q equals 0. But we know that the Voigt matrix, recall that we looked at the Voigt matrix earlier, the Voigt matrix has uh, d times d uh, plus 1 over 2 a matrix which is a square matrix of this dimension. So in order for the, the Voigt matrix to be stable, and it's, it, you, know, you can break it up into eigenvalues and multiply it times displacements, uh, you have to have at least d times d plus 1 over 2 positive terms in the energy expansion. So if I have a fully gapped system in two dimensions, this thing has two positive Things because there are only there are two, two dimensions of translation. But this guy has three. So that tells us that we don't have enough uh, oomph in the system to fully stabilize the mechanics, you know, the uniform distortions. And the modes that, that go along with those distortions are called the, 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 uh, uh, gosh, guess, the, the guest Hutchinson modes. And the one that we saw that was the most obvious is that for the twisted Kagame lattice, we have this uniform compression that costs no energy. Other lattices, which we will introduce, and maybe I'll show a uh, Mathematica video next time, have all kinds of different kinds of, of, of fiddly moves. So in three dimensions, we have three. But so the twisted Kagame lattice, which we discussed last time, it, it has no states of self-stress. Uh, it, rather, it has. Uh, it only has two states of self-stress, which go with the two degrees of zero modes. But the Kagame lattice itself, because it has these straight lines, has an extra state of self-stress. And it is more stable mechanically 
than the twisted one. In other words, all of its elastic moduli are positive. Okay. Now, there's just one other thing I wanted to do with before we go on to something different. I haven't lost my pieces of paper. Okay, now, what this tells us is that if I look at a two-dimensional system, for example, we can do it in other dimensions, and I look at the Voigt matrix, So let's look at 2D. So we have this matrix, you know, KXXXX, KXXYY, KXXXY, et cetera. Right. And if this thing operates on UXX, UYY, and UXY. So We've established now that if you're fully gapped, that there's one zero mode of the, uh, in this macroscopic elastic variable. So there, there is a set of strains So there's a vector in that space that has <coughs> that, that when operated upon by the elastic modulus constant here gives you zero. Now, so I know that that set of uniform strains gives me zero when, it op when it's operated upon by this guy. But, you know, once I have a, a set of ratios established, then I can ask, well, if that's true for a uniform one, what happens if I <coughs> convert these guys to IQX times UX? IQY times UY and one half IQX UY plus QY UX. So if, if these guys with the proper ratios give me zero when operated on by the elastic thing, then these guys have to give me zero when operated upon by the, by the uh, dynamical matrix, basically. And that's going to tell me what kind, you know, what kind of a zero mode I can have. So it turns out you can actually solve this for the ratio of QY over QX, say. I can solve that in terms of the U's, or the strain things. And I'll just tell you what the answer is, and you, you can do a, a homework problem on it. So this lambda, the solution is UXXGH times UYY gh minus the square root of minus the determinant of the u matrix, which is this matrix, yes, uh, yeah, uxx, uyy, uxy. So this is interesting. If the determinant of u, this is that, that determinant is uxx, uyy minus uxy, squared, the determinant of the strain. So if this guy is positive, then we have the square root of a negative number, which means that this lambda is going to have uh, an imaginary part that's plus or minus this guy. So what does it mean that I have an imaginary part to lambda? That says if qx is real, then qy is going to have both a part that has a positive imaginary part or a solution has a negative imaginary part. But what does it mean when y becomes qy becomes imaginary? It means I have a decaying solution. <clears throat> so what this tells us is that when the determinant of u is positive, then we have decaying solutions on the two sides whose energy is, going, whose energy is, just, is described at order q. Now this is an elastic energy that, that goes as far as Q or Q squared and omega squared. Right. But suppose the determinant of U is negative. And that's possible. If the, the determinant of U is negative, then we have that QY equals lambda plus or minus QX, which 
which means that there's a line in the, in the Brill 1 zone, two lines, where to linear order in Q, the energies are zero. So that then says that, that at, this, at that level, we have a breakdown of the elastic energy. It, do, it just doesn't have enough you know, terms in it to describe what's going on here, and we have to go to the next order. And indeed, what you find is that along these lines here, that you have to go to the next order, and omega is proportional to Q squared instead of omega being proportional to Q. Remember, when I have the phonons, the uh, frequency of the phonons is a sound velocity times Q. And what happens here is it goes as Q squared uh, at, only along those lines. As you move away from it, it's not true. And you may remember on Monday, I showed you the spectrum of the, one of the uh, topological lattices. And they had this line. Let's see. So in the Brill 1 zone, we had these lines where it looked like you had a zero mode. And they weren't really that. They were Q-squared modes. And the, otherwise, we would have violated the, the Calabine uh, Maxwell theorem. OK. So you know, th there's, there's really another week of lecturing that I could do, at which point you would all be zombies. Um, me too. Uh, so I can't get through all of the material. So I think what I'm going to do next is to switch over and begin setting the framework for discussing the topological properties, which is a, it's going to be a slightly different subject for a little while because I want to start off with the, the simplest version of things, which is the for heger model. Boy, this is exercise. OK, so the for heger model is a model for polyacetylene, which is one of the conducting polymers. Can't spell it. I forget where the Ys are. Probably a Y there. I don't know. Um, OK, so this is a CH2 chain, which schematically is something like this. There's a carbon. There's a carbon. There's a double bond. There's a carbon. There's an H that comes out here, a single bond, an H that goes out there another carbon, et cetera. So you know, this allows you to satisfy the, the uh, valence of C by having the H's sticking out. And <clears throat> you have now a double bond here, a double bond here, a single bond here. But of course, you could have had it the other way around. So <clears throat> I'm going to take a, a trivialized model of this, which has really most of what one needs to know about how uh, topological properties of the excitation spectrum are reflected in edge states. So rather than drawing it like this, I'm going to draw things like this. So this is the undimerized state, which you could have by you know, having some kind of a resonance where this guy goes back and forth, and you don't know exactly where the, next, the other electron sits. And uh, If you put in electron phonon interactions, then you have this Pyrrhal's instability where you want to dimerize the lattice. And there are two ways I can do that.
And I, I'm going to call these squares. So this is, the circles are sublattice A. And the squares are sublattice B. I'm going to take the liberty to erase this one so I can do this. So this is the first version, and I'll just call it the plus version. But I could have put the double bond here instead of here. So then we have etc. So this is this is the A sublattice again, and this is the B sublattice. Now uh, you know, by, by distinguishing between A and B here, you know, it looks like we have two different things, but of course, really, you know, the B is still a carbon, but we're going to think about this as being, you know, two separate versions, two separate ways of breaking the symmetry. Now notice in this one, a B always lies along a single bond to the right of A. Every time I have a B, if I look for the A behind it, it's always connected by a single bond, whereas the A is always connected to its left a double bond to B. This one's the other way around. The B is connected to the A beforehand with a double bond, etc. Now, to make things simple, what we're going to do is to assign hoppings in the you know, standard quantum mechanical sense of a V1 here and a V2 here. And I will you know, usually refer to the double bonds as having a hopping V2 and the single bonds as a hopping V1. And so with that model, we can write down the Hamiltonian, which is sum over sites S of a hopping V1, where I have a psi dagger uh, B S psi A S plus the complex conjugate. Okay, so that's what's going on right here. The first term is this guy. Well, that is the first term, right? So the first term connects these two like that. And then I have, and I'm just going to take the liberty of make the, making the hopping negative. It doesn't, it can be positive, but it's just some of the arithmetic looks cleaner. And then I have the B now is connected forward to an A. And I want to make sure that I use the same convention. There, there are about 25 different ways you can have a convention of this. At this point, I'm going to put in um, the A guy. So I go to the next, the next level over, over, and it connects backwards to B. So I'm going to write this as psi dagger A S psi B S minus 1 plus psi dagger B S minus 1 psi A S. Okay. So we can now calculate the, you know, the dynamical equations for this. Strictly speaking, you're supposed to take commutators and all of that. But if we take D H D psi dagger of B S, that will give me V1 A psi of A S minus V2 psi A S plus 1, right? Because here I could have, you know, I just move S by, up by 1. This would be an S and an S plus 1 here. And this should equal E times psi B S. And similarly, we can do the same thing for, for the B lattice. I've got all of those there. Yeah. OK, I should have stopped here and made the observation that we can write this in various different ways. 
And one of the nice ways of writing it is to write it as h is sum over s uh, psi dagger a s q s s prime psi b s prime with a v1 minus v2. No, I'm sorry. I, 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 I'm putting the v's in there. Plus, plus a v2 times psi dagger b s c s s prime psi a s prime, where q of s s prime is equal to v1 delta s s prime minus v2 delta s s minus 1 s prime, and c s s prime is v1 delta s s prime minus v2 times delta of s plus 1 s prime. So it's obvious I've used this notation because these guys are going to play the same role in this uh, model as the c and the q play in the uh, mechanical systems. Uh, I can also write this as uh, 1 over n sum over q capital Psi dagger of Q H Psi of Q where this Psi is Psi A of Q Psi B of Q like that and HSS prime or H of Q is zero Q of Q C of Q zero and these two things, C of Q is V1 minus V2 e to the i Q A, and Q of Q is C dagger of Q is V1 minus V2 e to the minus i Q A. So <clears throat> this is, of course, an easy problem to diagonalize. The energy is equal to, do I want it? Well, I'll just write it as Q magnitude squared because, you know, put the energies there and calculate the energies, and it's clearly Q times C, which is that. And that gives me that E is equal to the square root plus or minus, there's a pl yeah, plus or minus the square root of v1 minus v2 squared and a plus 4 v1 v2 os squared of qa over 2. Okay, so the first thing you observe is that if v1 equals v2, this thing is simply 2v times magnitude of cos qa over 2 if qa over 2 is equal to uh, pi over 2. Cosine of pi over 2 is 0. So is that correct? I've got that right over two, yeah. So um, we have then a spectrum that starts off, one of them is positive, it comes down and hits here at QA equals plus or minus pi. And then underneath there's another one that goes like this. These come in linearly, and you've got a system that's not gapped. Of course, you can periodically continue this but when I turn on V, make a difference between V1 and V2, you get at Q equals pi, QA equals pi, you get a gap which is twice the magnitude of V1 plus V2. And so you go from this configuration to opening up a gap like this. 
where this difference is 2 magnitude v1 minus v2. <clears throat> so, you know, that, that's the sort of thing we've been talking about for the phonons, that we have critical states where there is a zero energy. You'll recall when we discussed it in, um, on, on the Monday. We'll come back and look at that a little bit later if we have some time on that. But, you know, when we had the Kagame lattice alone, because of these states of self-stress, we had zeros along lines in the Brill-1 zone. Uh, and then when we twisted it, we gapped the spectrum, and on the zone edge, we got something that looks exactly like that. Well, I mean, uh, the, the origin of that difference is, uh, you know, has to do with, with how the phonons look there. It's not, this is a simple one-dimensional problem, and I have three degrees of freedom, six degrees of freedom per unit cell in the Kagame lattice, so it's a little, little hard to identify it exactly with this. But, but the process is the same. By twisting it, what, what replaces this in the Kagame lattice, this is magnitude sine of alpha, where that's the amount by which I twisted it. Okay. Um, why do I want to get so thirsty here? Okay. So, now we, we, we comment now. What we expect is that as long as there's a gap, then there are certain properties that don't change. And the minute you make the back gap go away, then things can change. So you're, you're topologically protected, if there are topological things, as long as you keep the gap and you don't go through the state with, with the zero. And so the same thing happens in the phonons. Now let's look at these equations. I'm interested in the zero modes. In other words, when I've got this gap, do I have a state that sits here right in the middle of the gap at q equals zero, at, at, at energy equals zero, uh, that is an edge state that's not described by this bulk spectrum? That's the question. And the nice thing about this system is that if I set these two things equal to zero, we can immediately see when there is an edge state and when there is not without doing any fancy stuff with the Fourier transforms. Um, so let me... So let's look at this equation. What this tells us is that psi a on the a sublattice at s plus 1 is equal to v1 over v2 psi a of s, which tells us that psi a of s is equal to v1 over v2 to the s psi a at 0, if 0 is the beginning. Now, one thing that is curious here is that when we said equal to zero, the S, the, the A and the B sub lattice is decoupled completely. Here's an equation of what's going to happen. We keep to have a zero mode. It's A and A only, or a B and a B right here. This tells us that we have a state decaying away from zero exponentially if V1 is less than V2. As long as V1 is less than V2, then we're going to have a state, or can have a state, that decays exponentially from a finite value at, at the beginning of the lattice. I shouldn't have erased it. Um, and if V1 is less than V, is greater than V2, then of course you have a growing solution and we're not going to have a zero mode at that end. On the other hand, I can write, I can say that psi A S is equal to v2 over v1 times psi a uh, s plus 1. Or I can make this guy s minus 1 and this one s. And I can put, and it's clear then doing this that psi a of uh, minus s is v2 
over v1 psi a of 0 to the s. So now I'm putting 0 here. This is 0, and I'm going that way. Or I could make this, if you want, I could make this an n. Make this an n, and then I'm, I'm decaying this way. So if v2 is less than v1, we have a decaying solution on the left side rather than the right side. Fair enough? Oh no, B sites can be do independent things, so they can also they can also have, have zero modes separately. Yeah. You can see how that's the solution also, but 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 that doesn't prevent you from having that. And so on, on the B site, I have psi B S minus one equals V one over V two psi B S. And so this is exactly the same as what happens to A when I reverse this, the sign of one. This tells me I have a decaying solution from the other side. Now, there, there is cause for, cons for caution and care, because let's go back and redraw this thing. So this would be a repeat of a unit cell, which I can define to be this thing. It's repeated and repeated. And in a sense, by drawing it like this, we've lucked out a little bit, because the site that sits at the far end there is the A site. And we've constructed things so that, well, if I choose that to be the 0 of the A site, I will get a decay going this way. Now, I could stop here, like this. Put the B there. And now, notice if I look backwards, I see the same thing as I see looking this way. In other words, I have a sequence going backwards of, of weak, strong, weak, strong. Going forward, I have a weak, strong, weak, strong. But this one starts with an A, and this one starts with a B. So in a sense, what I'm doing here is naturally defining a unit cell to be this one. And so to, to get the cleanest surface modes, what you want to do is to have a unit cell that has the last state, the last uh, atom at the edge be the one you want to look at. So if I stop like this, and I put an A here, you see this guy is not going to have a decaying mode in the A thing because I've, I've got the wrong sequence going backwards. So, the, so there's a direction or a polarization in the problem, if you wish. Uh, and that's, you know, it, it's done by this. So, so here, I can see the presence of the zero modes without doing anything fancy at all. And now what we want to do is to go see how this appears in, from looking at the spectrum and extracting a topological number, which will tell us how many, when I have a zero mode at this end and when I have a zero mode at the other end, and, you know, constructing things. So let's see how, we, excuse me? Well, it depends on how you join the two ends. If you join it with the right kind of domain wall, yes, there are zero modes. And I'll talk about that shortly. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, we, we, we did not get any, have much progress doing that, but there is a model that we have that gives exactly this, that's a mechanical model. See, this thing doesn't have a conservation law for, uh, you know, a, a broken symmetry tr translation. It doesn't have what the phonons would have of, of moving along. And so the model that we constructed for this consists of rotors that are pinned in place, and they can move this way, and they're coupled by a spring to the one next door. Uh, and that, that model actually has the, exactly the same spectrum as this. So I will, you know, probably won't have time to get. OK, let's see. I have, uh, the clock says I have, have 15 minutes and 44 seconds. Or, uh, I think I can do a little bit. 
Okay, so, so let's look at, you know, we suspect that we're going to learn something or be able to describe the presence of these edge zero modes by looking at properties of the spectrum and, and of, of these C's of Q. So this, let's do a Fourier transform. I have a V1 minus V2 e to the i q a. Now, there is this theorem. It's, let's, I'll just call it nu right now. If I have a complex function, if I put any function of z here, this counts the number of zeros for z less than 1 minus the number of poles in z less than 1. Okay. So, you know, this is basically a line integral around here. I look at this function each time there's a 0. I have a pole in this guy, and I pick up a plus 1. And if I uh, have the, a, a pole, it turns out I get a minus sign. So we could, we could apply that to this function here where I set z equal to e to the iqa. Now notice that this comes with a plus sign. And if I have, so, so I call z e to the iqa, and if we have a solution where the magnitude of z is less than 1, that corresponds to something that goes like e to the minus some kappa Times, times a, where cap is decaying. So, you know, having a plus sign there tells me that any zeros that I find inside the unit circle are going to correspond to decaying to the right direction. And so we can take our function. This guy is a function of z. It has one zero at z equals v1 over v2. So if v1 over v2 is less than 1, then this guy will give me this, this integral with a c of z here gives me 1, which is the number of zero modes that I have. And you can see that the zero that appears corresponds exactly to having a decay length, which is the v1 over v2. Okay. So there are no poles. So what this is telling us is that we should think about finding, you know, we have different choices for what our unit cell is. If we choose the unit cell so it's what I call um, edge compatible, I keep having to redraw this thing. So I would say that this guy, A, sitting like that, that's A compatible. And if I choose, and we'll see that this is true, we're already seeing it right here. If I choose this unit cell, then I end up having A in the right place, and my C of Z will have no uh, negative powers of Z appearing. Now, if I look at the, at the B equation, I still have it here. Yeah. Look at this guy. There's a minus 1 there. And what we get is, uh, we get that, so, so th th this corresponds to the Q guy, not, not, the, uh, not the C guy. So the Q is equal to, let me just make sure I've got the equation right here. I should still have this. This, this is going to give me, when I Fourier transform it, a V1 minus V2 e to the minus i q a. There's a minus sign there. And what that's telling us is that if I did what I told you before, we come and we terminate this thing with a b, then I have an e to the minus i q a appearing. And if I want to have a decaying in this direction, I want this guy to have a zero, and that is in fact, this is a, to have a, rather a, a, a zero inside the unit circle. So again, this is v1 over v2, and it shows that if we call that guy z, 
we will have exactly one mode coming out of here from that calculation. But if I'd, if I'd gone the other way around, OK, so, so, so this takes care of the first part. The second part now is to make an observation. Suppose I came in and chose the wrong, the wrong uh, unit cell, which is basically the wrong gauge. If, if I look at this thing running out to infinity, then it really doesn't make any difference whether I choose this unit cell or the one that looks like that. They're both, you know, they both describe the physics. And it's only when I look at the edge that I realize that I have, you know, would have a preference for one over the other. So what I should do is to provide you with an algorithm for simply changing the, um, the unit cell and, and what the C is. So what I'm going to do is to define a psi prime A of S to be equal to psi A of S plus 1 and a psi prime b of s equal to psi b of, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to make this s plus sigma, where sigma is arbitrary, and this is going to be s plus a tau, at sigma and tau are integers. So I can look at the equation for the a, where we had a, a v1 psi a s minus v2 psi a s plus 1 is equal to e psi b of s. And so now I'm going to replace these by the representation in terms of the primes. This is going to be a psi prime a s minus sigma, because now I'm expressing psi in terms of psi prime. So I set that equal to s, and that gives me a minus sigma with a v1 minus v2 psi a of s plus 1 minus sigma is equal to e psi b prime of s minus tau. So now I can Fourier transform these, and the net effect is that I'm going to have an e to the minus i q a times sigma here times, times c of q is equal to e to the minus q i q a times tau times, uh, here I put a psi a, and this is a psi b. And the net result is that I get a c prime of q, which is e to the minus i q, setting a equal to 1, yeah, sigma minus tau times c of q. Now what does this mean when I say that psi prime of a s is equal to the psi at s plus sigma. Well, it means what, that I'm going to, I started off with, a, for example, this unit cell defined. And I'm going to define then the psi prime. I'm going to not take this s, but I'm going to take the one that's one further down. So this allows me to switch back and forth between them. Um, OK. Ah, now comes the part that is not tricky, but it um, requires some care that I don't always have. Let's see if I've got this written down so I don't screw up too much. Oh, yeah, I have to go to this. OK, so I'm going to define, you know, so, so we have a, a number here. I'm going to call this new g is equal to 1 over 2 pi i integral 0 to some g dq dot grad q of the log of c of q. And maybe I'll put a sub c right here. OK, so this, in the one-dimensional case we're looking at, it's sort of, it's not too useful to introduce this vector notation. But by doing this, what I will do is produce a formula that's valid in higher dimension in the context of a simple calculation. So here, rather than, than integrating dz around the loop, 
I just integrate from two equivalent points in the Brill 1 zone. So this g is going to be some integer p times the reciprocal lattice vector b, where b is the generator. It's 2 pi over a times a vector in the x direction. And of course, this defines a line integral. And so we're only going to you know, integrate along qx. But this p can be plus or minus, depending upon what direction the g points. So this is telling me something about the number of poles, the zeros minus the number of poles in this function uh, when I, uh, and, and the g tells me which surface I'm looking at. So if the g is positive, then the g is going into the left surface. And if it's negative, it's going into the right surface. Okay. Um, so if we use, so we start off and we, we don't know which unit cell to serve to, to start with, but it seems natural enough to, to use the unit cell that we started off with, namely this guy, like that. So I'll use this as my reference cell. I could equally well have used the other one, but, but I'll use this one. So I'm going to calculate a number, which I'm going to call, well, mu sub t. And that comes from making this g be a plus 2 pi over a. And I'm going to use the unit cell where this is a c. So this number is equal to 1. We've already calculated it when we set the g equal to, to this. So that tells us that c of q, I can write as c of q e to the uh, i q a. That's, that's correct, isn't it? Let me just make sure. Yeah. Because now if I take the log, you know, the, the only thing that uh, i q C of Q, IQA, that's correct. I take the log. The log is this IQA. I do differentiate with respect to Q. I've got an A. I integrate from 0 to G. G is uh, 2 pi over A. I multiply it out, and I get 1. Okay. <clears throat> now I'm going to say, well, I really have a lattice where the positions on the lattice can be written as integers, uh, you know, R, R, R times the unit times a. And so I can write this as e to the minus i q dot r t. And r t I'm going to define to be minus a. These minus signs are an extreme annoyance. And it has to do with historical things where the, um, you know, the, the quantum people really didn't see any difference between C and Q, whereas in the, in the world that we live in, the C really has more importance than Q because I can't have, I can't have zero modes of, or, or states of self-stress at the end of a chain, whereas these guys can have, uh, you know, both the A and the B modes can have zero modes at the end of the chain, and that's because that. But, but I think that one should probably use this. So, so here we have e to the minus Q dot RT, and then if I do this integral, you know, differentiating along the x-axis, we'll find that um, what we get is that the, th this new t, which is, is really, I'll call it nt of g, is equal to capital G dot rt divided by 2 pi, where the g now is, because there's a minus sign there, is... Um, equal to the, to the outward normal and not the inward normal. This is, you know, if you, if you get these signs straight, your genius is all of you. I, but <clears throat> this guy, if I put here minus 2 pi a e x, that would be the vector pointing outward, away from the left end, and dotted it into minus a, which is what I said that is, and divide it by 2 pi, where a is a e x, you see I do indeed get the one that I want. OK, so this is, this is all right. Now, that tells me, just you know, because of the construction, that tells me the number of zero modes on the left-hand side. 
Now the question is, how do I find the number of zero modes on the right-hand side? Well, if I'm looking at the A lattice alone, we've already learned that going backwards, if V1 is less than V2, that was, of course, for the case V1 less than V2, the, the calculation I just did, there's no zero mode on the right-hand side. So I need to, and, and we saw that the, the problem reason is that if I look at the A lattice on the right-hand side, I terminate it at A, then I've got my unit cell should be this guy instead of this guy. And I need to then use this gauge transformation to take me over to the other one. So if I set sigma over here, I still have it. If I set sigma equal to 1 and tau equal to 0, then that corresponded to moving the A site from this guy over to that guy, and it converted this unit cell to that unit cell. So doing that gives me what happens on, on the left-hand side. And so what that tells us then is that C prime of Q is equal to E to the minus I Q. I left out the A here. Let me just put it back. A times the magnitude of C of Q times E to the minus I Q dot R T. That's what we just derived before. And I'm going to call this guy e to the minus q with an i dot rl, rl for local. And that gives us that the c, of, c prime of q is equal to magnitude c of q times e to the minus i q dot rt plus rl. Uh, yeah, RT plus RL. We already learned that RT is equal to minus A. And here, it's clear if, if I want to equate these two things, RL is equal to plus A. And the, uh, you know, the, the total count in total of G then is equal to G dot rt plus rl over 2 pi. And that's equal to 0, whatever g is. So we, we see that when we go to the, to the uh, gauge that tells us what's happening on the right-hand side, uh, we get the right answer now. And you can go through and, and uh, do what you will, will with the other thing. But in the end, this is the formula that we can remember. This is, this I should say is the zero mode, the, the number of zero modes at the other side. Now, it, it's, it, you should notice that when we do this, we change, we change V1 minus V2 e to the IQA to V1 e to the minus IQA minus V2, which means that when we look backwards, this is, this is the thing we want to worry about instead of an e to the iq. And so we have only e to the minus iqs that appear there, iqas. Um, OK. It says 0, 0, 0. Uh, this is a pretty good place to start. We'll go over a little bit more of this uh, tomorrow and then uh, go into higher dimensions. But it's worth, it's, if you're interested in this kind of thing at all, it's worth studying this particular problem carefully, because already it's a simple problem. You see how many subtle questions there are that, that you really need to pound your head against the wall to, to understand, yeah. Oh, I, I, I should have called this. The, the, this, this in the end, this in the end is what I'm calling, this should be N topological of G, which is sort of, you know, it, it, you know everything, this quantity is gauge, not gauge invariant. You know, it's, it's the other one that's gauge invariant. The final answer is gauge invariant. It doesn't, doesn't matter which gauge I choose. Uh, so just historically, we said we pick out one unit cell, and we're going to say, look, there's a topological number associated with that. <clears throat> In this case, it happens that it's counting just the number of zeros of the left-hand side. Now, In more complicated systems, you know, I can have a a, and in fact, that's what happens in the, in the uh, 
Kagame lattice for the phonons, is you choose a, a unit, reference unit cell which is nice and symmetric. The surfaces aren't symmetric. But you know, the choice of the, of the unit cell is that it has the, you know, there's th threefold symmetry of the, of the lattice. And that actually has zeros and poles, but it's a number. And then, then you go and you do the gauge transformation to go to the surface, and it removes the zero, that root removes the poles so that you know you're just getting the zero modes when you're looking at it. Oh, okay, new. I was using the same notation there. Let, let's, let's make this, this is, well, okay. New is used to, to, for the generic case to have where you have zeros and poles. And what I tend to wanted to use Cs to count the zeros, but um, the, the, strictly speaking, when you look at a general case, uh, this guy would be the topological one, and it has both zeros and poles. And, but, but in the end, rather than expressing it that way, we use this expression, which avoids all of the confusions once you've understood the first time around what you're doing with it. Time to wake up. Okay.